Good morning, everybody. How's it going today at Build? Everybody awake yet in the morning? N not really, okay. <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, hopefully you don't sleep too, through this too much. My name's Richard Weifel. This is my colleague, Dan Anderson. We're software engineers at a team at Microsoft uh, building mixed reality experiences. Um, first, I'd like to get an idea of just kind of what experience people have in the audience. Who in the audience has developed a 3D application before? Okay, so we've got about half the people. How about um, a virtual reality uh, application? Okay, a couple, couple people. How about for the HoloLens? Okay, a bunch of HoloLens people. Great, that really helps me out a lot. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about what it takes to build a mixed reality application for Windows and some of the lessons that we learned over the past year developing a project that we call Datascape. Uh, this talk's an introduction to mixed reality uh, development. If you're already an expert in VR development, you're going to find most of this information isn't new, and that's because developing for Windows Mixed Reality is similar to developing for other devices. First, um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a video here so you can get an idea of what Datascape uh, is like in case you haven't already seen our demo. We started developing Datascape with 3D map data because we've had many companies talk to us about the value of seeing their data in context on a map. Um, for our application, we chose to visualize spatial weather data because it's both beautiful and it also impacts every aspect of our lives and work. We get this cloud data and wind model data from the National Weather Service, and then we use that information to drive the uh, visuals that you see. Finally, uh, we allow the user to explore how the data can be used in a green energy scenario with uh, solar panels and wind generators. We wanted to prove out the Windows Mixed Reality platform by creating an experience for these new devices. Our team has a lot of experience creating HoloLens applications, and we wanted to put ourselves in the shoes of third-party developers for these new immersive devices because we think it's important to experience firsthand what all of our developers like you experience. At Microsoft, we believe that mixed reality devices will allow developers to create solutions that wouldn't have been possible with 2D displays. One area where we think this is particularly true is spatial data visualization. Viewing spatial data in 3D allows people to make new insights into data that would be difficult or impossible with a 2D, uh, 2D display. Um, with these mixed reality devices, you can move around spatial data naturally and take advantage of the experience that you've learned since you were a child on how to understand a 3D world. So we created Datascape to inspire other developers about what could be done with spatial data visualization and these new immersive Windows Mixed Reality devices. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and he's going to talk about building Datascape. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everybody. Um, all right, so I want to quickly show you how easy you can uh, get started. So for you who hasn't dove into 3D yet, uh, let me show you quickly how you do that. You download Visual Studio 2017. You get that new Creators Update SDK. And, uh, and then you can download Unity. That's what we used. Now, you, you don't have to use Unity. You can use any engine that you want using Windows Universal. Um, but you're now re ready to go. Uh, get one of those new wonderful devices, um, and you can start diving in. But before you dive in, let's talk about a couple of things that are a little bit different than, than uh, developing on your traditional flat screen, right? Uh, we should talk about staging a little bit. How do you want to, how are you running this one? You have new flexibility on how you're running your app. Let's talk about inputs and then performance. All right, so with staging, uh, you're flexible now. You can walk around. Uh, you, could, you could choose to, be, to have a seated, um, uh, seated um, sorry, experience. <laughs> experience. Uh, and so you can stay at, stay at your machine, slap on the device. In this, uh, in this situation, you might want to consider that you can't really rotate uh, left and right too, too much. Right? So left and right, at, uh, on, uh, in Datascape, we added something where we have rotation buttons showing up as you rotate left or right. 
to rotate your virtual world. Now, in a standing uh, experience, you don't have that, that problem anymore. You have your full 360, you can, you can look around. Uh, you can get rid of those, those rotation buttons. Both of those, uh, um, both, both standing and, and seated, you will have to, if you want to traverse your virtual world, you'll have to implement some kind of teleportation, right? Uh, and, uh, and this is something, there's, there are many examples of how to do good teleportation. We're just going to talk a little bit about uh, the, how, to, how to get this right, how to tune your, your experience to uh, get the comfort right, the user comfort on this one. So just, just this is an, an, an area where you want to spend some time getting your teleportation right. Uh, now, with um, if you have enough space, now you can have uh, what's called a room scale experience. You walk around your um, your virtual world. Now, if you want to go crazy, you put uh, you hook up to a laptop. You put that laptop in your backpack, and you can really truly traverse your virtual world. In uh, in Datascape, we um, we have higher fidelity of the world around you, lower fidelity you know, further away to, to help with performance. Uh, in, in the mode of, of, of room scale, we actually we, we download more higher resolution as you walk around the room, higher resolution around you. Uh, so if you have a big enough room, you can, uh, you can take a walk from Seattle down to LA, and the, the resolution follows you. And it's, it's very cool. <coughs> All right, on input, so you're running under Windows. You have all the input devices that is supporting Windows. You, you, you have access to those. Um, keyboard and mouse. Mouse works surprisingly well in a seated uh, situation. Uh, keyboard, a little bit more tricky because you can't really see it, but you can get creative. You can use that one. Uh, standing, you uh, use, your, use your Xbox controller with something that we, we found was really, really nice. We, we use the, the, the input paradigm called gaze, gaze and commit, same as you used to on, um, on HoloLens. Simply stick a cursor in front of your gaze, cursor moves as you, as you look around, and use any of the input uh, devices you have available to do your, your commands. Now, with the new APIs, we also have the, the new Sixtoff controller that was announced yesterday, right? If we detect in, in Datascape, if we if we detect a sixth off controller, we switch from gaze and commit to have the cursor being controlled by the by the new uh, sixth off controller, and um, lose control, we'll get back to gaze and commit. Right. So you got a lot of flexibility. You might want to consider like you can empower the user here to uh, you know use all, all kinds of different input input devices. It's up to you, Raph. <coughs> All right, and let's talk about performance. So again, for user comfort, and, and Richard will talk more, more to this, but we need to hit uh, 90 hertz, 90 frames per second at all times. We are now rendering in stereo, means two screens. They're pretty high resolution screens. And, and you probably want to run uh, anti-aliasing on it. We run, for Datascape, we have 4x MSAA. Um, so, Bottom line is we have lots of pixels to render and very little time to do so. So start easy. Do um, uh, you know? Design your scene with uh, with solid geometry in mind. Solid geometry will, will hide pixels for you, right? Uh, then uh, look into doing any type of uh, LODing technique, like I was saying, like high resolution geometry, close and uh, and small. You know, less 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 geometry in a distance. Um, and then try to stay away from uh, from uh, transparent geometry. Transparency will will hit pixels over and over, and you'll get you know too many pixels to render. Now that being said, um, we we wanted nice fluffy clouds. So now there are many techniques out there to get to get things to render render quickly, right? So one of the things we we did was. We use a technique where you, we render all, the, all our clouds into a quarter size screen, off screen buffer. We take that, stretch it back up on the screen, 
get a little bit of a blurrier, but so for, for nice fluffy clouds, it doesn't matter in the middle that the, the, the blur you can't really tell. And we do, we run a pass on, on uh, all that, that uh, uh, on, on all those pixels to figure out the edges. And then we re-render the edges uh, in high res with a, with a stencil mask. So we only render those in, in high resolution, all the, all the, the uh, uh, edges around the, the clouds. Um, so like I said, there are many tricks. And this one, that's one of the, the common one. Um, the, the thing we found though is like you, you're now in the world of 3D, world of stereo. Uh, so if you do, if you do clouds, for instance, on a, on a flat screen, you can get a handful of sprites and slap them on the screen, blur them together a little bit. You get a convincing, convincing uh, um, uh, illusion that this looks like clouds. If you put this in 3D, you um, you you instantly like pick up on shapes. So you'll see those flat planes sitting in front of you, and the illusion is kind of dead. So with clouds in particular, we had to we uh, we solved this by just uh, splitting them up to to more and smaller particles, right? So the the gist of it is just um, try out your technique early on device and figure out what you know. Some of the old tricks doesn't work anymore. You have to figure out new new ways of doing these things. Uh, and I want I want to mention like one. Um, we use uh, adaptive, adaptive rendering, adaptive resolution. Now, if you have, um, if you want to maybe target a variety of different machines, you have something that is that is not as powerful and something that is more powerful, or maybe you have seen like we have where um, the draw rate will will kind of uh, will change uh, depending on where you are. So I'm in Seattle, I got a lot of clouds. I'm in LA, I don't have any clouds. Um, I wish it was the other way around. Um, the, um, uh, so, in, so with adaptive rendering, we, what we do is we, uh, we measure the frame rate, right? And if, if we're about to hit, uh, hit 90 hertz, or if we're about to dip below, we, we lower the resolution of the, the screen a little bit. So you can go by just, just cutting off like smaller and you get a slightly blurrier experience, uh, but you'll, you'll maintain that 90 hertz, right? If you go, if you lower it to 70%, you kind of, 70%, uh, you know, width and height, you kind of lost half of your pixels, so gained a lot of, lot of performance back. And it's really, if you don't lower it very much, it's barely noticeable to users, too. Yeah. Um, all right. All right, let me talk a little bit about, so here, here's some of the APIs that we use and some of the stuff that you, you should get familiar with. So uh, in Unity, so the first thing, like, and especially if you're new to, um, to VR and this, this kind of stuff, the, um, the, the, camera, the camera just comes into Unity and, and the user is the camera and it's very cool and you, you don't really have to do anything. But the second step is like, well, you, actually you can't do anything about this, like the, the, the user is in control. You just have to deal with the consequences of the user poking his head through geometry and that kind of stuff, like you have to <laughs> figure out how to, how to deal with that. But really, you don't have to do anything. Unity gives you the camera. You're, it's, it's, it's happening already. Uh, there's there's new uh, input APIs. This is where you get your your uh, six off information, position, rotation, other thing. The little um, little controller gaze, uh, the the little ray from the controller. You have spatial information. This is uh, where you will find things like what where is my where is my ground. So um, in in Dayscape, we will put put our world at, at our feet. You'll also find things like what is the, the boundary, the boundary space that you set up already. If you want to prevent you from sticking your head through objects, you might want to put stuff outside of that boundary. Or if you want to, you know, be able to touch stuff, like then then you put them inside. Um, you, we have uh, we have device data. Uh, this is this will be special readings from from the device you're using right now. Resolution, field of view. You can use some of this stuff to. We, we used to figure out the best font size to use for, uh, by, by figuring out like the pixel density, basically, right? Um, you can also, this will also be where you would find if your screen is transparent or not. Um, World Anchor, if you, uh, so this is, this, this is one of the things we're using, but it's, uh, it's also from, if you're in Holland's world, you, you know a little bit about this, but it's a cool concept of you are saving off a physical position, basically. So in between runs, you can say, I have saved off that I, my, my water is right there. It's actually Richard's water. Uh, and then the next run, you, uh, you, can, you can get that exact position in, in your world space, right? 
And with that, let's go back to Richard. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> um, so next up, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that we learned um, while developing Datascape. So the first lesson, and this is the one that we really think is the most important, is to make sure that you test in device early and often. Dan talked about this a little bit. Seeing a scene in 3D is much different than seeing that same scene on a 2D display. Those of you who have done HoloLens development probably know exactly what I'm talking about. In 2D, it's very difficult to get a sense of the scale of objects, to get a sense of the distance between objects. It's easy to make things too big or too small. So you want to make sure that you're viewing it on device, because viewing it on device, those things will be very obvious. Um, likewise, for user interactions, user interactions in 2D are often very much different um, than they are in 3D. And so you want to understand how your users will use things. So you want to be trying that out in device, whether you're using the motion controller that was announced yesterday uh, on, on one of the immersive mixed reality devices, or you're using AirTap on a HoloLens. You want to make sure you see how it works, so you understand you know, what your developers will be experiencing. If you try uh, emulating that on a 2D screen, you're not going to have the same experience, and you won't uh, see what the users are going to experience until, until you see it on device. Um, in general, kind of rules of thumb that you've used for 2D application development don't always translate well into 3D, um, so you want to make sure you're trying to. An example um, for Datascape was the wind visualization uh, that we have. If you look at the wind visualization that we have, if you render our application on a 2D display, it actually looks a little bit overwhelming. It kind of looks like there's just lines everywhere. And if you were to tune it based on that, you might say, like, I want to make there to be less density in the lines that we're using to represent the spatial data, because it just is hard for a user to understand. However, when you view that in device, the uh, natural you know, ability for humans to be able to see depth you know, from 3D data makes it so that you don't have that same uh, kind of experience. And it, it's, it's actually tuned appropriately. Or, you know, kind of from a different perspective, if we tuned it into, if we'd, uh, if we tuned it so that it looked good on a 2D display and didn't look overwhelming, when you would get into the 3D device, it would have looked very sparse and like there wasn't enough data for you to really understand kind of that spatial information. The next lesson that I want to talk about is really how powerful it is to use 3D to solve these spatial problems. Um, the great thing about you know, all of these mixed reality devices is the insights that you can give you into this spatial data that wasn't previously possible. So you know, really make sure that you take advantage of that. Like, you know, each of you probably has some type of data in your business that's 3D or uh, you know, a vertical that you're looking at. And so you should think about, how can I take data that previously would be difficult to get insights from on a 2D screen and display it um, on the HoloLens. So like the wind model data and the cloud model data, if you're trying to view that on a 2D screen, you'd have to, you'd probably be looking at top-down views and you'd maybe be going through uh, elevation slices and trying to get an idea. But in 3D, we can just display all of, all of that data you know, spatially. And so that's really take advantage of 3D. Now, on the flip side of that, there's some, uh, there's some problems that aren't going to be appropriate for a 3D display that are going to be appropriate for a typical Windows 2D application. And so don't try to force uh, 2D things into 3D just because that will come off as gimmicky. Um, so take advantage of what you get by people's natural ability to see things in 3D at true size and scale. Uh, one example of this in Datascape uh, also is um, you can see if you look up, you can see the jet stream above your head. And if you look down, you can see the surfaced wind. And often, the wind at those higher altitudes are moving in much different directions. And the surfaced wind, you can really see how it interacts with the terrain. And in 3D, it's just really obvious and really easy to see. If you're trying to do that in 2D, it would be much more difficult. Uh, the next lesson that I wanted to talk about is to, we think it's really valuable to think about virtual objects as if they were real objects. Um, and the reason for that is for people who are running your application, to them, 
it looks as if it's real, whether they're in a HoloLens device and you're seeing you know, a hologram sitting right here, or if you're in an immersive mixed reality device um, and you're in a virtual world, to them, it still looks like there's an object sitting there. And so the more that you can do to make those objects act the way that a real object would, um, it'll make it easier for your users to interact with those objects because ever since you know you were a child, you've learned how to interact with the 3D world. You've learned how to understand the 3D world. Um, and so if objects in the virtual world um, react the same way that they do in a virtual world, you'll be able to leverage that knowledge that people have had since their childhood. In fact, um, this is an area where I, where I think as software engineers, we probably have a lot that we can learn from industrial engineers because because industrial engineers have been doing this in the real world for a long time. And I think that's a, you know, for people who are thinking about this, if you work in a company that has industrial engineers, it might be a good idea to go talk to them and see what are the kinds of information that they can share in helping you build a 3D application. So another important um, lesson for uh, 3D application development is to always be considering the comfort of your user. You're putting them into a virtual world or, uh, or a holographic world. And, um, you know, Dan talked about earlier how in a 3D application, you know, the camera uh, is the user's head and eyes. And so um, if you try to move that camera separate from the user's head, um, you'll have this issue where what the user sees visually doesn't match with what their inner ear is telling them with, with, with liquid sloshing around, and so that can cause discomfort. And so uh, a situation where you might consider doing that is if you want to teleport a user around. Um, there's a lot of research that's been happening in the virtual reality space about what are good techniques to use when you need to do things like that, like teleporting users. And so I definitely would recommend you that you read up on, on the internet of kind of what different things have, uh, people have been doing. Some of some examples are like avoiding acceleration if, you're, if you have to move the, the camera and using linear acceleration, or um, reducing motion in your peripheral vision because your peripheral vision is especially susceptible um, to, to this type of motion. So definitely that's something that you uh, want to consider. Um, uh, another important area of comfort is making sure that you render objects at the proper depth. Um, so when you're developing for a 2D screen, um, a lot of people use techniques where they, where they don't really care about the depth of things. So like a user interface, you might just uh, render it as the last thing on a, on a display and not care what, about what depth it's at. Um, but when you're in a mixed reality, um, you know, you can tell from depth perception how what the distance of devices are, and so if you of what objects are, excuse me, and so if you see an object at four feet and you see an, another object at two feet, and that object at four feet appears in front of the object at two feet, um, that's going to your brain's not used to seeing things like that, and so it's going to co potentially cause some discomfort. And so you want to make sure that you render things at the proper depth. The, uh, the last lesson that I wanted to talk about is directing the uh, user's attention. In a 3D world, people can look anywhere. That's awesome for the user, but can be challenging for you as a developer um, because you may want to direct them to something uh, particular in your application. So make sure that you use techniques to help the user out. Um, in the Windows Mixed Reality System, we have spatial audio. You can use that to create audio cues, perhaps to tell a user where to look, or you can use visual indicators to show them where to look, or you can think about it in the design of your application. So in Datascape, we have a user interface that we always want the user to easily be able to access. Um, and since we support a wide variety of input devices, uh, we can't rely on the user necessarily always having a motion uh, a device. And so we display our user interface up in the sky. And what we have is we have it so that it'll travel around to the four cardinal directions uh, on a compass, north, west, south, and east. And so wherever they are, all they have to do is look up, and the user interface will be somewhere nearby. So can think about techniques like that to understand and you know where people's user attention might be and to attract them to what's important for you. Um, so just a few closing thoughts um, before I end here. You know. Obviously, 
here at Microsoft, we think that these new mixed reality devices can really do a lot for spatial data visualization. I'm excited to see what those of you in the audience might develop for applications. Um, if you've already done uh, virtual reality development or HoloLens, uh, for the new immersive mixed reality devices, you'll find familiar tools. If you haven't developed uh, for Windows, for HoloLens uh, before, um, you'll find it's this, but you have developed for other VR devices, you'll probably be using much of the same tools. Um, and if you haven't developed for, for virtual reality or anything like that before, um, there's a lot of information out on the internet already because we are using familiar tools. Um, like Dan said, Think about how mixed reality is different when you're designing for your application, different than 2D, and make sure to take that into account. Um, and try your ideas and devices early as you can to see how they're going to turn out. Um, so I'm really excited of what all of you guys are going to build um, with, with kind of these new devices in this new ecosystem. So thank you for coming. Um, please check out the Datascape demo if you haven't already on the show floor in the Windows mixed re Immersive Mixed Reality booth. Uh, Pre-order your mixed reality dev kit. Um, there are code snippets from what we use to develop Datascape that are on GitHub as part of the Hollow Toolkit um, Unity um, package. If you've already done HoloLens development, hopefully you're probably already using that to make it easier for you to develop applications, and we're extending that to support these new immersive mixed reality devices. Um, and you can revisit this and other build sessions on Channel 9. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.